Hey, uh, good morning, McFarlane. My name is Michael Hecht. I want to thank Scott Retirement Services for sponsoring and giving me the opportunity to come here. Um, the program I'll present is one of the programs I presented at the Scotland Home over the years. I am the dementia care specialist for Scotland Retirement Services. And uh, for the campus, I do a lot of these art appreciation programs. So um, the reason I love Norman Rockwell is an 80 year old and an eight year old can stand in front of his pieces and have a conversation. Very few artists uh, can claim that. The other thing I like about Norman Rockwell is this. I basically call it reading paintings over the years. It's got to be over 20 years I've been conducting these programs. Uh, the trigger for it, um, my father was a pretty bright man, gave up college for his sister. But uh, it wasn't until he was my age in his 70s that he went with me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He lived over 40, 50 years in New York, immigrant from Poland. And I asked him as we climbed the steps, Dad, you're a pretty bright guy. How come you never came to the museum? You like to draw in art and design high school. And he told me he didn't think he was smart enough. And that's one of the foundation triggers for me. And I love Norman Rockwell because what we'll do is in the beginning, we're going to look at his work and read his paintings. And then I am going to give you some samples of pretty well-known Renaissance painters. And we're going to read their work. And um, I love Rockwell for it. He's like a doorway into art. So let's start. And, and I want to thank uh, McFarlane TV for streaming it. And I'm going to give out. I've, I've got them all. Oh, yeah. That's, that's okay. You have them all. Let's, yeah. The skull ones. What? The skull ones. Yeah. We're only going to look at the one where we see the policeman and uh, restaurant owner and, uh, and the young boy. So, anybody want to talk about it? What do you see? And then I'll give you my opinion. A runaway boy. A runaway boy. And the police officer just kind of visiting with him. Visiting with him and might have brought him over to the diner. Um, the other thing about Rockwell that brings the levels is it's three men, okay? And we have people that are in the community. And when I work with people on the memory care, I always say, and your generations is extraordinary, ordinary people. That's what Rockwell is celebrating. And that's why we connect with him because he's honoring the people that get up in the morning, go to work, or do whatever they can for everybody, maybe, but for themselves. And Rockwell always admired that. I'll give a little bit of stuff as we go along. But the first thing I want everybody to see, because it's a recurring theme, is that the boy is looking at the policeman and the restaurant owner, and they're all a triangle, but the policeman and the restaurant owner were once that little boy. And that little boy will one day be these grown men. Rockwell is always doing that, okay, in all of that. He gives subtle hints, of course, the runaway bag down here. And he's also allowing the community to help with the boy and give him an idea of his future and what he could be. Okay, so Rockwell just, he was shunned, Rockwell, by the abstract expressionist painters. Um, some of them made fun where they just called him a hallmark card greeter. Um, his son famously said at his eulogy that my father never raised a fuss at other artists and other contemporaries, but my father will one day be remembered always by the United States and the world. 
And he's right, okay? Um, I always equate that to Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein felt bad that he didn't make more classical music. And when I saw him interviewed on TV, I wanted to grab him by the neck and say, Leonard, as long as the planet rotates, everybody's going to know West Side Story. So just be, just be good. You did right. Okay? So let's keep moving because there's a lot of work to see. And when I pull the, the themes, you'll notice. This one's probably one of my favorite. Okay, it's called Amazing Grace. And the first thing we notice, the people are in a restaurant, a small town restaurant. Now, I was born into the borough of Brooklyn, New York. And when I was born in 1952, already there were 4 million people just in the borough of Brooklyn. And here I am in Stoughton. I only know two things about Wisconsin growing up in, in Brooklyn. I knew Wisconsin, the college football team stunk, but I can recite Vince Lombardi's name forward and backwards and name your entire defensive line, okay? But here I am the last 20 years in, in um, Stoughton and McFarland. I live in Cottage Grove. So we have a small town restaurant. And back then when Rockwell was working, if the restaurant was crowded, you were asked to share a table. Okay, sometimes you shared it with strangers, but this way everybody could sit down and be accommodated. So let's look at this picture. And anybody want to name? You guys want to name the people? Not name them so much, but try to guess who the woman and the child is. Grandma, grandma. grandma and her grandson, right? The other two young men are strangers, okay? And what is grandma doing? Praying, saying Praying, grace. Yeah. Saying grace, okay? And what Norman Rockwell does, and we'll see it later when I show you the Renaissance and Caravaggio, is he does his own religious painting, okay? It's not going to try to copy a Renaissance artist. And so what he does is he takes something very simple. She's saying grace. And we'll point out another thing. And the two young men are getting ready to smoke a cigarette. And they kind of stop their action, right? Because they're a little bit startled to see someone pray, right? And so Norman Rockwell, there's always a reason behind the great artist. He's not accidentally doing this. And so in the middle of all this going on in the restaurant, here they are praying, okay? The other thing that he subtly does, and we'll see it in the other great paintings, is we notice the window with the light, okay? And you notice that the light is really the background to grandma, okay? And really what Rockwell is doing, it's a spiritual light. It can go all the way back to the Renaissance, putting that spiritual light on this moment of this woman saying grace, okay? And not only does he do that, but if we go down to the foreground and we see a dirty plate, right? A dirty table, it hasn't been bust yet. And yet, right opposite is this high moment of amazing grace. And what Rockwell is pointing out is what Christ said, any place can be a church, okay? And Rockwell emphasizes it by putting a table that's dirty. He didn't make the whole rest on it immaculate. He kept it the way it is, and he wanted to accent this spiritual. You see that there's figures there, but they're incomplete, okay? The reason why they're incomplete is this. All human beings have this, okay? If he puts these figures complete, okay, you are not going to go beyond the border of this work, okay? By putting it halfway, you automatically, there was no uh, plan or anything, it just came right to you. 
you pictured the entire restaurant. Okay. If he does it only half or he does it whole, you're not going to go beyond the borders. You're not going to picture the restaurant. By simply doing that, he knew right away that the viewer is going to imagine the entire restaurant. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. And I will stop when uh, these two gentlemen, gray smoke comes out of your ears. And then I'll know to stop. Okay? All right. Now, I think it's, let's do these. And then I want to make sure that I include something that people had criticized Rockwell about, but it was undeserved. Here's another one painting I really, really love, and it's Coming Home. Okay, so anybody tell me the year of the painting? 1945. Yeah, you saw the date, but if you didn't see... May twenty sixth. Right, but if you didn't see the date, what's the hint? What's the clue that you knew what time, what period of time it was? You look more time, yes. and because of the young man, this is the beauty of Rockwell, and to me, this is the essence of why we love Rockwell. Okay, so General Patton unfortunately gets killed, but Dwight Eisenhower comes home. The generals come home, okay? They get ticket tape parades. Where do they get ticket tape parades? Down Fifth Avenue. The TVs cover it, everybody covers it. But we learn that without the grunts, without these soldiers, there are no generals. And Rockwell wants to point this out and even pound it into showing us. So what he does, is he has a soldier coming home, doesn't even have him coming in through the front of his building, his tenement. He has him coming in the alleyway, the back of the tenement. And he's trying to say that, again, the same kind of with the dirty table and this amazing moment. This is an amazing moment. The boy is coming home and his family is coming out of their home, ready to greet from the mother to his siblings to even the dog. And Rockwell, of course, loved to put dogs in his pictures, you know. Not only does he do that, Rockwell, he has the handyman on the roof stopping in the middle of his work. And to show that it's just another day, the laundry is out. So there's no ticket tape parade. There's no TV cameras. But here, without this young man, we don't have Eisenhower. We don't have all these big wigs. And Rockwell is telling us, and he's celebrating this young man. The other thing Rockwell does, if you notice, the young soldier has his back to us. And Rockwell does that on purpose. Okay? And the reason is this. I know. If I stand like this, you are going to pretty much look at me and your viewing will stop there. But if I do this, your viewing is going to go all the way to the wall. And that's just human beings. So Rockwell knows that. So what he does is the boy's back is to us. So we're in the alley now. We're watching this scene. We're viewing it. Rockwell grew up in New York City. And the reason he never lived in a big city after that him and his brother had witnessed a mugging outside of their window. And it really affected him for the rest of his life. Okay. So he knew what it was to live in a city. But the beautiful uh, painting of it is he has his girlfriend right on the side, hiding, waiting for everybody else to get their greetings done with the young man. It's a great, great painting by Rockwell. Let me just say that Rockwell... All of his work was started in oil paintings, okay? And he was a funny man for this reason. And 
I am not a scholar on Norman Rockwell. And I always feel if someone tells you they're a scholar on anything, I run the other way. Okay. Because I found through the years that you really have to find out about it. So I'll give you an example. Norman Rockwell would take you two fellas and say, I'm going to dress you up in the era of Tom Sawyer. Okay. And he learned that from working at the Metropolitan Opera. He saw what costumes can do that I don't have to live at the time of Mark Twain, but I can get the clothing to simulate that. But this is the fun part of it. So you guys would be modeling for hours. Imagine standing for hours in one position or taking a 10 minute break and then doing it for another couple of hours. And supposedly the story is one of his friends came by and said, Norman, you know, there's an invention called the camera. Why don't you take a picture of these two guys in their costumes and then just paint from that? And Norman, the story says, hey, that's a really great idea. So he started doing it. But let me just point out that it's worthwhile to always find out, even when you're dealing with the art world. I took my family years ago to Oshkosh to see a, a Rockwell exhibit of his paintings. And as I was talking to my family about his work, one of the curators there came over and said, excuse me, sir, but Rockwell never painted from photographs. So, you know, and by then I'm in my 40s and 50s, so I'm a very quiet Brooklynite. You know, when I was 25, I would have looked at this guy, oh yeah, buddy, you know? Instead, I said, you know how you go to exhibits and then when you come through the gift shop at the end of the exhibit, you can buy anything that relates to the exhibit. So I said to this young man, I said, I'll tell you what, we're going to be here another hour. Go look through the Norman Rockwell biographies. And if they don't say anything about photography, you make sure you come and get me. I never saw that young man again. So there's so much information out there and so much information not given. I'll give you one unfortunate thing about Rockwell. Um, I knew one of the art history teachers at UW. His mom was a, a resident years ago on our memory care. Anyway, we got to talk and I told him how much I really love Rockwell. And I said, do you get to teach Rockwell at all? And he said, I get five minutes in the curriculum. And that was it. And he himself loved him. So Rockwell unfortunately suffered from that, but he never said anything. And I, I wanted to mention that because I'll show you something. So he got criticized in the 1960s for not, uh, for not doing enough and bringing attention to civil rights. And I wanted to show you a particular picture he did. And that's a young African-American girl getting escorted to school. And he almost does, I don't know if he did it first or Charles Schultz did it with peanuts, but he doesn't show you the, the, the faces of the adults. He just really shows the young girl. Um, I'm not gonna even say the word that's on the wall, um, it's pretty offensive to say, but he did do these pictures on civil rights. And I'll give you the reason why we didn't know about them is because Harper's Saturday Evening Post, all the magazines said to him, Norman, we love your work. You know that we'll, we'll print and use whatever you do. However, if we put in your civil rights work, the chances are we're going to lose half of our subscribers, if not more. And that's why we never saw his civil rights work. So I just wanted to bring that into it just to give you that all these people that were condemning him. And the class of Rockwell is he never got into verbal fights with other people about it. All right. So let's gently do this. Let's take Rockwell's reading of paintings and start to look at other artists, okay? 
So I had a nice reproduction of this, so I wasn't going to make copies. But you've all seen this pretty iconic painting, American Gothic by Grant Wood. Okay? So Grant Wood is an artist from Iowa. And he goes off to Europe because he said, I can't stand being in Iowa any longer. All right? So he goes to Europe. And he runs around in Europe, sees all the cathedrals, all the great artwork, the masterpieces. And guess what he says to himself after a while? I think I'm going back to Iowa. I've had it, you know? So, you know, you always go home. So he comes home and he's driving through the roads in Iowa and he sees an actual house with this window, American Gothic, okay? And if you look at the window, it's Gothic shaped. It's not a square like we normally see. So he said, I'm gonna do a painting, American Gothic, and it's almost all art is like this, no matter what anybody says. Art does not happen at that moment. What happens is you put a seed in the brain, Grant Wood going around in Europe, and he sees this window and that seed becomes the flower. So it takes time for these things to germinate. It does not happen at that moment. So he decides to make this painting. Okay, so let's look at these two people that he does. Okay, let's first, this is his sister. He wanted his mother to be in the painting, but he knew his mother at the age she was could not stand and model for the painting. And his sister agreed. So she said, you know what, I'll stand in. And the pendant is their mother's. So she wore that in honor of their mom and she's standing here and we'll come back. This is a great story. This is Grant Wood's dentist and they became really good friends and the reason why is if you invited Grant Wood over to your house for dinner the first thing Grant Wood would say you have sugar he loved sugar put it on everything so if you eat enough sugar what happens to your mouth right cavities whatever so needless to say he went to this guy a lot and they became friends so he calls him up and he says, look, I want to do this painting. Would you come over and model? So his friend says, of course, you know. So he's got his dentist and his sister. So let's look at, and Grant Wood and Norman Rockwell are contemporaries. And there's always something humorous or something they're trying to communicate to us. So let's see what he's all about. Okay, so let's do the sister. So let's look at her hairdo and her face, okay? If you notice, she's got a tight bun, a little strand of hair here, and she's wearing the same fabric that's in the window, okay? What kind of profession or what kind of woman would you say her character is? A librarian, a teacher, was she easygoing? What would you describe? Probably back then, just a homemaker. A homemaker. <coughs> Very serious, yeah. right? Okay, extremely serious. No funny stuff, okay? Let me just fix this mic. Okay. So it sounds like an art lesson today, and uh, the speaker is Robert De Niro, right? Okay. So we get her very frown, very serious, just nothing. But Grant Wood says, nope. He put that strand there, and that strand represents... <coughs> that strand represents that if you brought a six-pack of beer over, she would share it with you. But she's not that, all that frowning serious. Here's the interesting one too, the dentist. What would you say the dentist is made up for? 
Does he resemble anybody? A pastor. A pastor. Anybody else? Farmer. A farmer. Before. And that's it. We're not going to go past pastor and farmer. And the reason why you said pastor is what? Michael. His dress. Right. And his butt, he's got overalls on that have been really worn out. The farmer, why did you say farmer? Because well, of the fork and the bibs. And the bibs yeah. and the fork. Okay, here's an interesting thing. Out in Iowa, he's living among farmers. Small town, okay? This goes on display in his hometown in Iowa. He gets calls from his neighbors who are farmers. Grant. How could you put three prongs on that pitchfork? It's, and he didn't want to tell him what the picture was really about. So he made out, he says, well, this is a special pitchfork for hay. Just a bunch of hooey, he's telling him. So if we look at the pitchfork, it's got three prongs, okay? There's no accidents. Grant Wood has the man's hand really gripping the handle of the pitchfork, okay? So let's turn it and go back. He's a pastor, okay? He's a pastor. The building behind them would be what, maybe? With the Gothic window. Church. A church. That's okay, yeah. There's no wrong answers, you know? I don't want to hear my voice all the time. So, a church. Then we look up here, and we don't quite see what this is over here, okay? And most likely, if we have a church and we have a pastor, most likely on top of the roof is a what? A cross, okay. So Grant Wood puts all the elements, and remember he saw all the cathedrals in Europe. It's his religious picture, okay? And what he does is, most likely, it was an ordinary weather vane, okay? It wasn't a cross. This wasn't a church, okay? We know he's not a pastor, but who else had the three-pronged pitchfork? The devil. The devil, okay? All art is based upon symbols, and the art world and the great ones, what they knew to do because they wanted you to get it. They didn't want you to walk in. So what he's doing is saying, this is a pastor who's got his grip on the devil, wrestling with the devil. Okay. So it's a religious painting and it's called American Gothic and it's Grant Wood. Okay. So how does that keep going? Let me show you. Let's see how we're doing. Good. So now we're going to Florence and we're going to the Uffizi Gallery. And then we've looked at some paintings, we've read some paintings, and this is the same thing. We could read these paintings. Okay, the majority of people at these times were illiterate. The only people that really could read and write were in monasteries. Okay, the average person, whatever it is, we don't get the Gutenberg press with the Bible for a long time yet. So let's read this religious painting. Okay, beautiful painting. Okay, so who, who are in the picture? Okay. Mary and baby Jesus. Mary and baby Jesus, yeah. Okay, so let's look at it. The first thing I want you to see, because it's going to come up later, is look behind the heads of Mary and Jesus. You see, that's called the Nimbus. Okay, and you'll see that until we get to Da Vinci. Okay, we see the Nimbus. So, if you hold... And if you've had the opportunity, whether it's your own children or nephews and nieces or a friends, if you hold a baby in your arms like Mary, okay, let's say I put a baby in your arms, are you going to 
have a sad face or a happy face? Happy, right? We're all going to be happy. That, you know, if you look, Mary doesn't look happy at all. Okay? All these great artists were all well read. The men and women. Um, biblical scholars, some of them, such as Michelangelo. But they were well read. We know that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is here as a baby, but he's already, we can term it, an adult. He's just in human form as a baby. Okay? We all going with that? All right? And I love this part because here's this Jewish guy from Brooklyn. All right? But I, you know, and I got a Lutheran wife, so I love talking about this part of it. You know? It makes perfect sense. So, baby Jesus has got his arms around his mother. And here's the great part of these great artists, okay? He knows from his readings about the Bible and about Christ's life that Christ is not a baby in what we would term a baby. Christ is Christ. And so what he's doing, his mother is sad. And anybody want to think about why she's sad? She knows that her baby son is not going to have a long life. She knows he's destined, okay? We understand that. So what the great painter does is he has Jesus consoling his mother. See the arm wrapped around her? And he's giving her comfort. The other thing the artist does, and nothing's by accident, if we look behind Jesus, and what do we see? We see an archway, right? But what do we see coming down from the archway? A pole, right? That's supporting the arch. It's placed there on purpose. What, again, we're looking at symbols. What could that pole symbolize? And you can take a wild guess. I'll give you a, okay. The pole symbolizes the cross and the crucifixion, okay? He doesn't, the artist does not have to throw it in your face. He puts a symbol of later on what the future will be for that baby. Therefore, once we think about it, it makes sense the baby is consoling his mother, okay? What we don't see in this is if you look at the middle of her dress underneath her blouse that blouse is in red and red of course is blood and it all comes together and that's how you read paintings okay and these great artists wanted you to get it their stories okay everybody good okay let's do another one All right, who do we have here? Again, Mary and Jesus, and we have a, another baby. Anybody want to guess who that baby is? That's John the Baptist. Anytime you see a figure, baby, adolescent, adult, carrying the staff, that's John the Baptist. Okay? So let's look at this painting. Look at Mary's face. She's got two naked babies now. And she's got the saddest face, right? So again, this artist is saying the other important thing that happens in the Renaissance and these great artists, okay, is that you could see a faint trace of the nimbus, right? If you look above Mary's head. This is the Holy Family, and what the artist is doing is a couple of things. He's got Joseph all the way in the darkness. He's got Jesus grabbing on to the bottom of the staff as if the artist is saying, Jesus will now carry on, 
Okay. And Mary's got a solemn, solemn, sad face. And we already recognize now that she knows the future of her boy. Okay. So what these artists are doing all the way to Michelangelo and Da Vinci is they're taking Mary down and making her stand on ground equal to us. Prior to that, she was kept above here and we felt separate from the Holy Family. But Jesus said, I want to be equal. I'm standing right there. So what the, the great artist does is not only does he communicate the future, but he has a curtain. If you see the curtain, it's drawn. And we see all the way to the back, right? The landscape. The curtain is drawn as if to say, this baby will change or affect the world outside. Okay? Beautiful art. All right? So with that, I want to make sure we have time to show how it works. It's not the best of copies, but... The Last Supper. And if we have time, anything else, but I'd really like to get to The Last Supper. It's pretty amazing. So, the first thing Leonardo da Vinci does with The Last Supper, um, it's Christ with his disciples. And the moment is Christ says to them, one of you are going to betray me. Okay? And then they're all reacting to his words, okay? So we know about that part of it. What we don't, most of us don't know is this. So he gets a monastery in Milan and he's asked to put a fresco up, okay? And he put, he starts it around here on the wall, let's say. Doesn't start it down there, he starts it about here, okay? And there's a reason he does that. This is a room that we'll talk about at the end of it. So he puts a fresco up and Leonardo da Vinci, brilliant. He knew he was the smartest person in any room he walked into. Um, he tried different ways to make a fresco. And most likely, unfortunately, either maybe 25, 50 years from now, it might be gone. Um, because he did a different method and the conditions of the monastery just don't lend themselves. And they stopped remodeling it because the people that were remodeling it to keep it going, they said, if we keep working on it, it's gonna become our painting and not Da Vinci's. So it's better left to do whatever it needs to do, okay? The thing that I remember in art schools, everybody was dominated by perspective. They were teaching us how da Vinci used perspective. After 50 years of looking at this painting, my feeling is that that's the least thing I care about. Tell me about the painting and tell me about da Vinci, okay? And I, I'm not gonna exactly, but in his 20s, he was accused of sodomy, put on trial and acquitted. I'm not gonna get into he was a homosexual or if he wasn't, he hated what they did to him, okay? It stayed with him his whole life, okay? Just putting him through that. And back then, if you owned a fruit stand, and you didn't like me personally, you could go to the police station and they had a box and you could say, Michael took an apple. And whether I did or not, didn't matter and put it in there, and they'd come and arrest me, and I got to prove my innocence. And that's what happened to da Vinci, okay? So, unfortunately, that was the system. So, there's reasons for that. The first thing you cannot see, but da Vinci takes away the nimbus. After da Vinci, you no longer see the nimbus around paintings about the holy figure. Why? Because da Vinci, his belief is that the Holy Family is not up here and the congregation is here, but they're equal. Okay? So he took away that nimbus and makes them human and makes Christ human 
and the disciples. So they connect, you know. Okay. I'm not going to get into the Da Vinci Code and everything like that. But let's jump ahead because it needs its own program almost. So they're sitting, and basically it's a dais, right? We've all gone to weddings or other celebrations, and uh, the people that are being celebrated are sitting at a table above the rest of us, right? Okay. During the time of Da Vinci and Michelangelo, and coming up behind them is Martin Luther. The Reformation is on its way. One of the things that triggers the Reformation, one of the things that Da Vinci and Michelangelo both shared and distaste for was the usury of certain members of the church, which basically was, you guys wanted to do a candy store, you needed two bucks, I gave you the two bucks as a from the monastery, from the church, but I wanted $10 in return. Michelangelo and Da Vinci knew about this. They didn't like it. They thought that's not in the practice of Christ. Okay? So Da Vinci has all this in his head going on. So he puts up this painting of Christ in the middle. The disciples wants the church to behave like the church, to honor the words of Christ. Again, let's come back to the room. The room that the Last Supper is in is a room that the monks in the monastery will see three times a day, every day of the year. Anybody want to guess what the room is? Dining, Dining room. room. Dining room. So all these monks come in every meal, and there's the dais, lifelike Christ, and what Da Vinci, it's Da Vinci, just like Rockwell is telling us, Da Vinci says, you better behave and do right, because he's watching you. And he knew what he was doing. Not only does he do that, but if I'm Da Vinci and I invite you and the town to come in and see the painting, I'm opening it up for the town to see. You're going to look at the table and you're going to say to your friend over there, hey, I got the same plates and forks and everything at home. Okay. Now, it's impossible for in Christ's time to have your utensils and everything. Am I right? Da Vinci does that on purpose because what Da Vinci wants is to put Christ in the presence, okay? So whatever year it was, and you walk in as people of Milan, you see that it's in your time. That's what Da Vinci does. So for me, as an artist and going to schools, it's all well and good with perspective, but those to me really make the power of this painting. The other thing about it is if artists had the opportunity in Germany, uh, Belgium, England, France, word would get out. Da Vinci's got a painting going on. You should go see it. And so most likely word of mouth spread and the artists came to see the Last Supper and thus it spreads throughout Europe. Okay, so let's do one more. I will close the program with it. My favorite artist is an artist named Michelangelo Caravaggio. And Michelangelo Caravaggio broke 11 of the Ten Commandments. Okay. I don't know when he found time to do art. And he really brings out all the way what we're talking about um, this morning. Okay, so Caravaggio, some people agree, some about 35 paintings. Um, he was put on trial for murder. He actually went to the defense of a, a woman who was a prostitute. Um, and when I say prostitute back then, there were very little avenues for women, single women or women in general, to have jobs and make a living. But again, Caravaggio is for another time, but 
one of the amazing things about Caravaggio is his paintings are awesome. He affected directors like Martin Scorsese. He affected directors like um, Francis Ford Coppola for the lighting. Okay, if you've ever seen Goodfellas or The Godfather, that black and white lighting. Again, just think of it, Da Vinci and Caravaggio, they didn't have this. They had to light their work with candles. Just further amazing and make their own paints. We don't have tubes of paint till 1840s, all right? But anyway, let's get back to this. I know it's a little dark, but he's got Mary and baby Jesus. She's holding him and she does have the last remnant of the nimbus, very, very faint, okay? She's actually in an alleyway in Rome, okay, boarded by a door frame. So again, what did we see with Rockwell? We saw the prayer in the restaurant and a couple of feet away was this dirty table. So Caravaggio is almost doing the same thing. You know, he's taking what we would pass as ordinary or not the best, and he's putting Jesus there with Mary, really making it among the people, okay? And he's got these two people, a man and a woman, and they did a pilgrimage. I know it's tough to see, but they're holding their staffs, right, from walking, okay? Um and we can almost, I'm not going to even go there. But again, we have Mary leaning up against one of the door frames. Almost, again, foreshadowing what's going to occur with the crucifixion. Okay? But this is the great part of Caravaggio. He, and when his paintings were announced going into a church, there was a line as if Star Wars was opening up at the movie theater, okay? He would be in and out of jail cells, and I'll just equate it to what I know. The Vatican would call up and say, you got Caravaggio in jail? Well, yeah, you know, he did that. Look, you got to let him out because the pontiff wants him to finish that painting for that church. And, of course, you listen to the pontiff and what he wants he gets, so they release Caravaggio, Okay. Caravaggio hung out with all the fringe of society. Pickpockets, thieves, hung out in taverns, okay? He was never someone who schmoozed. He dressed like Romeo of Romeo and Juliet, had a long sword. He always carried, died when he was about 35. He looked like he was 85 when he dies, okay? But if you get a chance, look him up. But the most important part again, is this. If we look down at the man, we see his rump is in our face, right? In the foreground. And remember what I said when I said, if you look at me, you're pretty much not going to look at the wall. But if the soldier turns his back, it's the same thing as if. So he does that same thing that Rockwell does. And he does that because now we're in the alleyway watching this scene, okay? Then the most important thing for me looking at this great piece is you come down to the feet of the male, male pilgrim. And I don't know if you could see it real, but they're not clean. They're still dirty from the pilgrimage they made. And what Caravaggio knew is Christ said, come as you are. And so here's uh, someone who broke 11 of the Ten Commandments. He knew what he was about. The best thing about him, he knew, was his art. If you took him away from the art, he had trouble dealing with the rest of his life. But when it came to this, here was someone we would consider not part of it, but he would be, you know, when I first worked at Scotland and I worked in the memory care, um, I had the people come off the unit. And prior to that, most memory care wouldn't have people come off because they were worrying about safety. And uh, anyway, 
and Scotland was great. They saw the difference of the people's faces, how happy they were to be able to mingle with everybody else. But I also said to the staff is that when your savior comes back, if he comes to Scotland, the first place he's going to go to is memory care. Okay. And Caravaggio was always sympathetic to the lowest rung of society. And by doing that, he actually raises that and makes us better for it. And that's why he has it. If you could see the lighting, even with the Xerox, how he puts the lighting on Mary and the baby. All right. I'm going to stop there. Um, I want to thank uh, McFarland Cable. I want to thank the E.D. Lock Library. And um, everybody have a good morning. Thank you. Michael, what's your favorite Norman Rockwell painting? Probably the the two I've showed you, the the homecoming. Well, yeah, I would say the homecoming and the, the grace was good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, the mic had to fall on. Yeah, that's all right. Oh, thank you. Oh, there you go. Yeah.